you look at the opportunities and you need to take risk as long as you feel all the factors can fall into place and then you have a great outcome. Call them change makers. Call them rule breakers. We call them redefiners. Join us in conversation with daring leaders who are creating extraordinary impact and driving change from around the globe. Each episode gives you a fresh perspective on your leadership and career journey. I'm Hoda Tahoon, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds. I'm Clark Murphy, the former chief executive officer and a leadership advisor. And this is Redefiners. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Redefiners. I'm pumped about today's episode because we get to talk about art with one of the most influential people in the art world today. He's a true redefiner for his unique vision in leading a massive cultural institution while also keeping his boots firmly on the ground at a gallery level, always with an eye on the artists. In fact, this person oversees one of the most iconic institutions in the world and one of my personal favorite destinations to visit. Anytime I've gone to the exhibitions at this place, I've been wowed by the curation and programming, and the storytelling is always incredibly done. Well, Hoda, I've got to say, as a, as a New Yorker, I'm pretty excited not only about our guests, but I'm always fascinated by those who have to oversee something with really deep history, but keep it relevant in today's world. And how do we keep pushing relevancy? And, and our guest is really quite famous at that. And the guest is Max Holine. He's the director of the Metropolitan Museum of Art and will become CEO of the Met this July. He guides the museum's artistic vision, all its programming, research, and collection initiatives. And he has a deep history of leading institutions towards growth, but as I said, with cultural relevancy. He understands yesterday, today, and has this vision around tomorrow that really makes him unique. His knack for visionary programming is known around the world, and we're very excited. Max, Welcome to Redefiners. Thanks for inviting me. Good to see you. Good to see you. And, and I have to say, the Met is iconic in the Murphy family. I used to live on 81st Street around the corner for many years, and our eldest daughter literally learned to count to 10 on the steps of the Met. Oh, wow. And then every Friday night, we would go hear the chamber quartet on the mezzanine. And you may know the first violinist is a woman named Beryl. And um, she inspired another daughter, Caitlin, to take up the violin. So, you know, the Met is part of New York City's life as residents, but of course, it's this iconic destination for everyone to come see around the world. So we are incredibly excited and um, and we'd love to get right into it. Terrific, terrific. And great to see that uh, all your children have kind of had, the, the institution had such an impact in many different ways. So that's, that's fantastic to hear. Max, we're going to start off with a really tough question. You're responsible for keeping watch over one and a half million objects that span 5,000 years of human creativity, which one is your favorite? Ugh. And if that's too hard, can you recommend one work that you'd like to spotlight today? Obviously, that's an impossible question. As curators or museum directors, you develop almost like idiosyncratic tastes for something kind of sometimes even a little bit more quirky than others. So, so I, I think it's more a recommendation of uh, something that I kind of go back and again and again and find out uh, something new. So one of the really fantastic paintings in our collection is Georges de la Tour's uh, Fortune Teller. And what I find so fascinating about this painting is that it is essentially, it's almost like a theater piece. It is a painting that's like a still within a longer narrative. And you can see that something has happened before, something will happen afterwards. It all is happening on a, almost like a, on a narrow stage brings us to something that's really important here at the museum and that we need to further excel on and we've, that we've embarked on in a vigorous way, that it really is also about the narratives and the storytelling, both in the objects as well as in the bigger picture that we provide for people so that they can engage not only with an, an artwork per se, but really with the, the bigger stories that these artworks represent. And we have to realize that art... Um, more often than not, didn't come into existence in a vacuum. But more importantly, it is always kind of connected to certain social, political, historical um, agendas. Even. Mm -hmm. In all of that, I feel that the, the museum can be this great storyteller, this great narrator, this complex institution uh, for many different audiences to connect with. 
You know, I love that you talked about the storytelling and not to be biased because I'm Egyptian American, but I have to say that the Egyptian exhibit is masterfully done in terms of its storytelling at the Met. It's truly outstanding. And every time I go, it reminds me of the many times I've been to the ancient monuments in Egypt. And that story comes to life in every visit I've gone to. The stories never end once you enter the doors of the Met. It's just incredible. You've curated much more modern and contemporary art. Why is that important for the Met? And and how difficult was it to make this pivot, this investment, not just in the walls, in the rooms, but in the culture of curation and those that work in the Met? I'm quite curious. The Met was founded by trustees. Some of them were artists. And probably one of the core missions at the beginning of the Met or from the beginning of the Met was basically to properly influence the creative forces in this case, within New York. So it was basically meant to be almost like a learning tool, an educational tool for the artists and artisans in the city to make better work, to kind of learn from from their peers, etc. So the Met has always been engaged with contemporary art and culture, which, by the way, actually differentiates us from all of our other peer institutions. So the British Museum, the Prado, the Kunstdeutsche Museum in Vienna, the Hermitage, Uh, None of them kind of have contemporary art. Their collections end somewhere. So the Met is really this one universal museum that starts from the beginning of art making to, to now. But I think it's important for an institution like ours to be thoroughly engaged with contemporary art and with the contemporary environment. And for that reason, we are also uh, building the modern contemporary wing. If I have one aim, then I, then I would like to see the Met becoming a truly contemporary institution. Mm. And with that, I don't mean mainly or only contemporary art, uh, but I think it has to be an institution that really reflects, exhibits, is in dialogue from a very contemporary perspective. Uh, and sometimes that means also uh, engaging with, with contemporary artists. In other cases, it just means looking at art developments that are 500 years old, looking at them from a contemporary lens, looking at them, them from, from a way that how we can perceive them now. I can tell you one thing that when I was interviewed for this job, uh, becoming the Met director like five years ago, the trustees of the Met asked me a question. They said, well, tell us something about the collection that we don't know. And I guess they were expecting that I tell them something special about, uh, I don't know, Jan van Eyck, some kind of special kind of aspect of early Netherlands painting. <laughs> but what I said to them was, what you probably don't know is that half of the Met's collection doesn't tell the truth. Mm. Uh, that is basically its artworks are done for a particular purpose, for an agenda. And that art is kind of, in that sense, more often than not, also propaganda. Same as we see in our current contemporary environment, so much of our visual culture serving a certain purpose, being aimed at something, trying to change public opinion or whatsoever. You need to look at art uh, not only with a lens of, okay, let's, let's just make sure that we get the dating right, but really also let's make sure that we make people understand what these works meant back then and If you look at it from a contemporary lens, you can make, so to say, without forcing it, you can often make a bridge to, and that's how it relates to us now. Um, And so uh, with that context, I think that uh, the Met is this big institution that spans over many centuries, remains and is first and foremost also an institution that is contemporary, that thinks contemporary, and that reflects on history in a contemporary way. And culturally, so we look at organizations, whether it's universities or museums, Uh, or companies around the world trying to remain contemporary or become contemporary, and their leaders have to set a tone. Was there a cultural shift for you to help this happen, or do you think it was already there? Is the Met evolving as as an institution? I think, Clark, I mean, evolving is the right word. There's no moment where you can say, okay, that's a a seismic change or a pivot or whatsoever. This institution is so not only big, but multifaceted. And Mm -hmm. there are so many great uh, thinkers working here, so many important uh, forces that basically you need to, I would say, sometimes accelerate uh, developments that are already there, or you need to make sure that people can seize the opportunities that could be in front of them. So I think what we have clearly initiated much more than before was a collaboration. And I know this sounds like, okay, of course, collaboration. Uh, why, why not? Uh, I would say that 
because of our high level of specialization within the museum, you clearly have a, have a culture that is uh, extremely based on expertise, but that can go very deep. And in that sense, sometimes uh, without it wanting to be quite siloed. And so the, the idea that we have different voices or different departments work together in basically showing that, I don't know, I'm just coming up uh, like, uh, that the Middle Ages are not just actually a Middle Age in Europe, it's actually also Asia and, and Africa and kind of you mm. show that dialogue. So, so all of that kind of helps. So I, I think a collaboration is a really important aspect of that and fostering that and sometimes forcing that is, is really important because with it come new ideas, uh, new ways of looking at that. And that leads me to the second part, uh, which I think is also absolutely crucial, is to allow a multiplicity of voices. Mm. Museums tended to speak with one voice, meaning like, okay, I'm the docent and I'm telling you how you need to see it. The reality is that also within our institution, we sometimes can't even agree on something. So one example that I could give you about that is just because it's quite tangible. So when the, the big discussion happened about the Salvato Mundi uh, painting, this uh, notorious uh, yes. uh, Leonardo, not Leonardo painting, uh, we had at that time three of the worldwide leading Leonardo scholars on our staff. Mm. So out of the, I don't know, six that do exist, uh, three were here at the Met they could not disagree more about the attribution. So back then, the Met didn't then say anything about it. Under my tenure, I would have said, well, listen, that's exactly what we should talk about. That's exactly what we should tell people. We can't agree. It's it's so complex. So we have three different eminent scholars and they just have very different perspectives. So this idea of a multiplicity of voices and, and, and various perspectives uh, is really important. And even for our audiences, sometimes it's, more interesting to tell them what we don't know than always only telling them what we know. Max, as you think about this multiplicity of voices and collaboration, what's currently happening is you are overseeing an 80,000 square foot, $500 million expansion. It sounds like as you're describing this continued move to become more contemporary ties in so nicely with the sustainability piece so that you're continuing to think about the Met, not only today and the future, but sort of bringing those two pieces together. Absolutely. I think sustainability in the biggest understanding of the word is at the core of what we do. Uh, and sustainability doesn't, of course, mean holding the status quo. Mm -hmm. Sustainability also means advancing our goals, advancing the, the institution's commitment to change and also making sure that we stay relevant and are an active participant almost like the, the discussion that's happening in society. And that basically brings us into the ecological uh, questions, but really also in, in regard to what kind of participant we are as a public citizen in, in the discourses that basically matter to us most. I'm fascinated by that. Could you go a little bit deeper? How do you participate as an entity around sustainability? If you take it on the, on the narrow definition of the term, it's basically, okay, uh, how much do we participate in reducing our ecological footprint? How do we operate? How we, do we make sure that we are tied into our low emission goals and how do we make our operations more efficient? So a lot of our capital projects, a lot of our changes in the building, and this is a very old building, uh, are geared towards that and will essentially basically reduce that by 30, 40 percent. In a bigger definition of the world, I'm assumed sustainable. And because in a sense that they are, of course, institutions that need to be supported, that need to have the public opinion almost on their side of saying, okay, these are relevant institutions for us. They do matter. And so, so for us to make sure that we are sustainable and that we are also sustained in that sense, it's important that we continue to evolve and also that we are participating in the discourses of our time. And so I strongly invite any kind of discussion happening around broader topics that have a cultural background, they should be reflected in the museum with the art that we exhibit, with the programming that we put forward, or even just providing a platform for that discourse. I think in our current time, there are very few areas, let's even say rooms, where you can have a, a profound discussion in an 
not immediately confrontational way. Yes. <laughs> if I look at uh, TV or whatsoever, I mean, it's all geared towards either yelling at each other already, uh, very quickly, so because that kind of gets <laughs> people agitated, or being already in one camp or the other. And I think that the Met, with its centuries of history, of cultural history, but also with it being a platform of, of an entirely civic institution, this is where some of these debates, these discourses, these kind of exchanges can happen in that, uh, that profound way. And I, I think that's deeply meaningful. As we think about the forces that have brought you to this concept of convening and the platform for discourse, your father wanted you to be an artist, but instead you studied business administration and art history. You earned a master's degree in both. How did this form the art and the business world and then and then continue forward as we think about your foundational years? Well, so yeah, I grew up in a very artistic environment. My father was quite well-known architect uh, and my mother was also very deeply connected with the art world. All the friends of my parents were artists, some of them very famous, some of them not so famous, actors, etc. I remember fondly when we went out for dinner with people uh, Always, like after two hours, people started yelling at each other at the table, like all these artists yelling at each other. <laughs> next, the next day, they were really big friends again, but it was always extremely passionate uh, and, and engaged. So my revolution against my parents was basically studying business administration because that was unheard of in my family. <laughs> huh? I studied basically these two, art history and business administration, each in a different university. So, so I did them simultaneously at two different universities and finished both with a master. You know, what it allowed me to do is not only learn about two very different subjects, but actually also connect with two very different groups of people, actually. Uh, so the, the people who studied business administration were a bit different than the ones who, who studied art history. And I, I didn't really know how I would combine these. I, I worked uh, during that time as a journalist for a daily newspaper in the business section. I worked as a copy editor in an advertising agency and, of course, did a number of things at, at museums. But it was really an internship at the Guggenheim Museum back then that kind of opened my eyes about how a museum can actually really operate, how it can be programmatically relevant, but also business-minded, and how a museum plays such an important role was in the social fabric of a city, a metropolis like New York. So the then director actually uh, said to me during this internship that whenever I finish my two studies, I've got a job. And maybe it was just, you know, this typical New York meaning like we should have lunch soon and that's just mainly, okay, let's, let's, yeah. let's get, get out of the way. Uh, <laughs> but I can basically call them and said, well, I'm finished with my studies, so I, I, I will be ready to come. And in fact, they hired me. It was literally my first job and I became very early on then the, the assistant of the director and then the chief of staff uh, at the museum. I would say probably the youngest and most inexperienced chief of staff in museum history. Uh, <laughs> but it still was an enormous experience and a learning environment. It was certainly formative. But after about five years or so, you decided to leave the museum and New York to take over a very prestigious, yet stumbling at the time, gallery in Frankfurt. Clark and I spend a lot of time talking to leaders about risk and how they assess for it and think about it in terms of their own careers. And oftentimes leaders take some risk in order to catapult them and move them forward. Tell us a little bit about why you took such a big risk. So the one thing was, I was still pretty young. I had a very intense working environment at the Guggenheim. It was extremely important for me, but I started to notice that I might become almost like a copy of the then director. Mm -hmm. And while we had an enormously good relationship, it's just, I said, I, I need to break loose. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm, I might not no longer be, so to say, authentic. I, I, I need to kind of do my own thing. So I kind of, I forced myself to do something else. And, you know, it's, it wasn't easy. Like New York is, of course, a great place to be. And nobody really understood why I would want to go to Frankfurt of all places. <laughs> uh, but I saw an opportunity there. I saw an opportunity where there's an institution that was really stumbling and was basically on the verge of being closed. And I went there. Yes, it was a, a big risk, but I had a certain plan of what could be done. And it, it worked out, but it was a risk. But I think one thing that I've learned and that I continue to do is that I'm not saying it's totally sophisticated game theory, but it's really that you look at the opportunities and you need to take risk as long as you feel it's all the factors can fall into place and then you have a great outcome. Things certainly went wrong at the beginning there. And maybe one or the other person would have said, okay, it's not working. I can't do this or it will fail. 
But basically, if you just see it as almost like still a path that you're on and you either double down on it or whatever technique you use, you can kind of convert, so to say, risks that might even set you on a, so to say, potential negative path. You actually convert them into something more productive. Um, so I, I strongly believe in that that anything is always an equation with a number of variables. Mm -hmm. And just because one variable goes sour doesn't mean yet that the equation isn't leading to success. You just need to make sure that you can juggle uh, all of them uh, until the moment where you're able to convert the whole thing. Uh, and mm -hmm. there's a certain, maybe in, in my sense, maybe from my parents, I have a certain artistic attitude, risk-taking in me. I like to be playful. Basically, I sometimes try to disguise in the way how I dress and uh, or whatever it is. <laughs> but there is a, a certain, it's not anarchistic, but it's you, you play by the rules, but you can also bend them and you can, uh, in order to, to, to reach the goals that are best for who and what you work for. And that, that kind of served me well. We'll be right back with Max Holine. But first, a quick break with Katie Navard, an associate in our San Francisco office. Katie talks about the rise of new philanthropy and how models of philanthropic leadership are evolving. Philanthropy, just like arts and culture, is reckoning, adapting, innovating, and charting a new path forward. The world is changing, and sectors are needing to come together like never before. Because of this, the lens has shifted from causes to systems. Organizations are in a position to positively impact today's global risks by addressing them systemically. And every success offers opportunity to access resources and partners to greater good at a larger scale. Our report, The New Philanthropist, will give you a clear lens on the philanthropy of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. According to the report, the myriad of social challenges the world will face in the next century, from climate change, racial injustice, gender inequity, and global instability writ large, requires that we innovate, test, and scale solutions at a pace never seen before. For the first step on you or your organization's journey to channel impact during this important time in our history, visit russellreynolds.com. We'll also make this link available in the show notes. Thank you so much. Now, back to our conversation with Max. Max, you talk about the passion at the dinner table, listening to artists as children, and you talk about your friends as artists today. Given the, the nature of an artist and this passion and this... Um, energy and, and sometimes discourse, running a museum, running a gallery, but maintaining friendships with, with these artists and finding the right line of making decisions about what moves forward and what doesn't. You do have a number of friends who are quite famous in the art world today. How do you find the right line of managing those relationships? So first of all, I think that uh, artists, uh, besides a lot of other things, are, of course, Extraordinary seismographs of what is happening and where things are leading. So I find these conversations extraordinarily interesting and important for my own worldview and also for also in regard to the museum. Same though as I as I find conversations, of course, that I have with business leaders are uh, fascinating and important. But artists kind of have that ability. I think the difficult piece for me here in in regard to the relationships is that while I have enormous, not only respect for artists, but I also love many artists' works. All of these, uh, these artists love the Met. And what they love, of course, most would be to exhibit at the Met. Mm. And that's something that I can't fulfill all the time, right? Because the Met is, is a great place and we do an enormous amount of programming. But contemporary art is not our sole focus. We do one or two shows a year maybe on a, uh, on a contemporary artist. So I have in this city probably 200, 300 artists that I strongly believe in. And we have many more that we strongly believe in while we expand our collections and we make sure that, uh, that that's kind of properly represented. I know that I'm disappointing uh, people in a certain way because of course, if, if you're an artist, sometimes you hope, okay, this would, should be now my time to uh, to be exhibited there and I, I have something really important to say. And also my work is so much in relation to the art of the past, etc. And all of that is true, but you cannot kind of fulfill uh, all of that. So that's actually the, the more tougher piece that I have to navigate in a sense. I go to galleries, I also go to artist studios. So I go there because I want to engage with the work 
And sometimes I, of course, raise expectations to that, mm. not on purpose, but it's obviously, I come as Max Holline, but to a certain extent, a lot of people see me, of course, as the director of the Met. And that might be a, sometimes a difficult thing to navigate. It's really something that uh, we developed to, together and, and we have specialists, outstanding curators, also in the, in the area of contemporary art in many different areas. Max, what advice do you have for those that are curating their careers, perhaps in earlier stages right now, at that intersection of art and business? So the first advice that I would have is more often than not, people study or learn cultural management, this, that, and the other thing. And I feel that it's really important that one creates his or her own approach a mixture of this uh, in the sense that uh, mm. I, I think for me it was really important to have a deep understanding and also a deep relationship with art history, with artists. Yeah? So I, I'm totally passionate about art. I'm not saying like, okay, I'm a museum director, I need to know a little bit more about art, but then essentially I'm a manager. No, I'm an art historian, I'm a curator, I'm, I'm a, a, a great friend of artists. Um, and on the other hand, I also have deep interest in, in business and economics and how the world functions in that sense. So I think it's absolutely important that you first and foremost develop your own both identity, but actually also make sure that you have the understanding, the authenticity, and also the tools at hand. So that for me has always been very important. Max, we all have a moment in our lives where everything changes, either literally or philosophically. And on this podcast, we call it a redefiner moment. What's yours? Well, I think that the redefinition moment is COVID and the, the discussions that came with it when, with Black Lives Matter and the whole recording with American history uh, was an important um, accelerator of mm -hmm. developments or, or necessities that were already around. And it helped us moving forward. I would also say that that time made the museum, which is uh, the Met, uh, a little bit insecure uh, about kind of what is the right way. And that actually, was actually a huge uh, opportunity because the Met is more often than not an institution that basically can sit in itself saying, okay, whatever we do is excellent. We are so great. Let's not change too much, right? And so I think that that's a moment where, where you become a bit more flexible, where you can execute some of the necessary next steps quicker and more impactful. Um, just on that one last question, on COVID, Henry Tim's at Lincoln Center, uh, who was a guest, talked about the realization in COVID and coming out of COVID of the need for culture and arts as a convening, as a celebration, as a, a form of common joy and experience of life, whereas the online world pre-COVID might have driven us to stay home, to stay alone. How do you look at this, this moment in history in COVID, coming out of COVID, and, and, and the relationship to the arts? I totally agree. Solitude is a real issue in society and a real problem as a whole. And it certainly was significantly expanded through COVID time. So the moment where we were able to kind of not only open up again, but communities coming together again and just celebrating being together. And I think the museum or, or of course, Met or Lincoln Center are, are perfect places for that. That certainly is very clear. And the relevancy for museums in that context, there's no doubt about that. But it was also clear that cultural institutions then also became an even more important place to understand your own history. And to have a certain level of even reckoning with your history. And while we talk sometimes about representation and cultural representation, not seeing that as almost like a complex agenda that you have to tick off a couple of boxes, but really understanding that if you are a place where, so to say, communities feel connected to, you just need to make sure that you are also able to properly reflect the artistic output of that community, that you are able to stay connected with some of these, not only histories, but narratives, and that you, uh, you are able to participate again in that dialogue so that you can actually be the place where you can both celebrate as well as engage. Max, we like to end each podcast with some rapid fire questions. So this is where we'll ask you a series of questions and you respond as quickly as possible. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. What is your preferred method of exercise? Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I, so <laughs> I run uh, um, probably only twice, uh, twice a week uh, around Central Park. Uh, that's it, unfortunately, in regard to exercise. You, you caught me there. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most important room in your home? 
clearly the living room. We've been a family of five here now, kind of two our, to our kids are already studying abroad, but uh, it's been a place of constant being together, uh, uh, coming in and out, and also our, our friends ca- coming in. So that's the enjoying living together. As you can imagine, for, for also as a family that has moved around quite a bit, being together, also sometimes in one room, is quite important. If you could have dinner with any artist, living or dead, who would it be? That's so difficult, but I, I would say I had the most memorable dinner uh, at our home with Joseph Boyce and my parents. I was young and Boyce was coming there, of course, with his felt hat and everything else. <laughs> it kind of felt special and strange, and I would love to have that dinner again. If you could own any single piece of art, what piece of art would it be? So my, my first real artistic experience where I really felt shaken was an early Francis Bacon painting mm. uh, on a, uh, one of the popes. Mm. And I, I then traveled around in Europe actually to see it in different shows. So I would love to have, have one at home. And what do you do to relax? I have to confess, yeah, I go to galleries um, and, and look at shows. Mm. There you go. Not surprising. And that's how you stay relevant. Well, Max, we want to thank you for being here today in such a wide-ranging conversation. And and you end a little bit where you began, as, as we talked about, uh, the Met and the storytelling, as you began with the fortune teller and you end with Francis Bacon. Art tells a story. It pushes you to think about it, to get out of your comfort zone. But as we think about contemporary and historic relevancy, we have to remember that Art is connected to the political, the historical. These events are the storytelling. And the history of the Met began with the dialogue of artisans and artists learning from each other and understanding what was then a contemporary scene and now is a historic one. So we must continue to use the art world to learn today, yesterday, and think about tomorrow. It's a perspective. It's a history of dialogue. I love the fact that you said half the museum doesn't tell the truth because it had an agenda at some point. So as we think about agendas and communication today, we need to think about both sides of that context. And for you as a leader, tapping this expertise that could have been siloed or can be siloed, but the departments, whether it's another institution or museum, the fact that collaboration sometimes forces new ideas when someone might be more comfortable in their own silo, but we're forcing new ideas to to allow this multiplicity of voices. And I think the nothing has become more relevant in the last seven or eight years than knowing the power of multiplicity of voices um, and then telling a story of what we learn. We don't think about museums in sustainability. And, and I don't mean the efficiency, the energy footprint, the operations, which you're hard at work on and ahead of schedule. Museums, do they matter? Are they sustainable themselves in a digital world? And for you to stand the test of time, You've got to evolve and participate in the discourses, as you've discussed. As we think about a museum or, or, or a media or a podcast, there are a few rooms for profound discussion without confrontation. And it helps the Met to be sustainable because it's a current platform to convene. I love this concept of convening. As you've taken risk, this sense of juggling variables, some of them negative variables, to then pivot to take more risks, to follow the variables. And look, lo and behold, you go from, from an art history major to, to running the Met. So from a career advice standpoint or risk advice standpoint, create your own path, embrace continuous change. The model today will not be relevant in 10 years. Find your authenticity. And you found your authenticity by regarding artists as seismographs. And I think we as business people could think of companies and businesses that evolve as seismographs for the world in which we live. And you've come back to this sense of, of convening by being in the galleries and the studios to understand what's important to propel the acceleration of the art world, embracing insecurity to accelerate change as you did coming out of COVID. So you are sustainable, you are relevant because this accelerator of insecurity keeps you thinking about the future. So we have a lot to learn from, fantastic education, um, and we have no visuals. Imagine that. We learned all this at the Met today without a visual. So Max, Unique. thank you, thank you for the audio, not the visual. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you so much, Hoden Clark. Thank you. Thank you so much, Max. All the best. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Redefiners. 
For more compelling insights from leaders across industries and around the world, listen to Redefiners wherever you get your podcasts. And to learn more or to get in contact with us, visit our website at russellreynolds.com, find us on LinkedIn, and follow us on Twitter at RRA on Leadership.